came across something a few years ago. A church in Michigan had decided they were going to promote what they called No Excuse Sunday. And here's how it was written up. Please join us next Sunday for No Excuse Sunday to make it possible for everyone to attend church next Sunday. We are going to accommodate everyone with the following. First, cots will be placed in the vestibule for those who say, Sunday is my one day to sleep in. <laughs> Steel helmets will be there for those who say the church, the church will cave in if I ever walk through the doors. Blankets will be furnished for those who say the church is too cold and fans for those who think it's too hot. We will have hearing aids for those who think the band is too soft and we will have cotton swabs for those who think the band is too low or too loud. Scorecards will be available for those who wish to list all of the hypocrites who are present. <laughs> Some relatives will be present for those who like to go visiting on Sundays. I like this one. There will be TV dinners for those who cannot go to church and cook Sunday dinner too. One section will be devoted to trees and grass for those who like to see God in nature. And finally, the sanctuary will be decorated with both Christmas poinsettias and Easter lilies for those who have never seen the church without them. <laughs> Pretty cool. <laughs> All right. Well, one of the very best devotionals you could ever read is one by a man, Oswald Chambers. The title of this daily devotional is My Utmost for His Highest. And in his entry for Christmas Day, December 25, this is what he writes. Jesus Christ, he says, was born into this world, not from it. He did not emerge out of history. He came into history from the outside. Jesus Christ is not the best human being the human race can boast of. He is a being for, hu for whom the human race can take no credit at all. He is not a man becoming God but God incarnate, God coming into human flesh from outside it. His life is the highest and the holiest entering through the most humble of doors. What caught my attention about the, 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 the breadth of the Christmas story is that it's all about our Lord and his humble frame of mind, his choosing to humble himself in ways that are just breathtaking. So that's what we're going to look at this morning, and that's what we're going to talk about, the humiliation of Jesus Messiah. If you're following me in your Bible, Luke chapter 2, but we'll also, as normal, put each uh, passage on the screen. By the way, there are really only two somewhat detailed accounts of the birth of Christ in the New Testament. For example, there is first of all Matthew chapters 1 and 2, which unfold the story of the birth of Christ, the Magi, uh, etc. The second account is here in Luke chapters 1 and 2. And as you read Luke's account, it's pretty clear that he has gathered much of his information from Mary, the mother of Jesus. In other words, Mary is his primary source, 
But then also, we should never forget when we go to the Bible, what we must factor in is this truth. All of the biblical writers, Old and New Testament, They were inspired, they were led along in their writing by God the Holy Spirit. For example, 2 Peter chapter 1, 21, Peter said, For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Uh, 2 Timothy 3, 16, All Scripture is inspired by God. Uh, The word inspired in Greek is the word theonoustos. Theo means God, noustos, breathe. So all scripture is literally God breathe. Uh, I have been asked, how how can errant men come up with an inerrant Bible? The Bible never claims to be written by errant men. Its source is ultimately an infallible, perfect God who can create nothing less than an expression of his perfection. Now, I'm sharing this with you simply to remind all of us that all the Bible is God's accurate message to us. And for myself, I have to tell you, I have complete confidence in the veracity of Scripture, in the fact that the Scriptures are indeed the inerrant, infallible Word of God to us. In fact, it's interesting, in Luke chapter 1, Luke writes about the accuracy of his message as well. Notice how he begins his gospel. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile an account of things accomplished among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, meaning the apostles. It seemed fitting to me as well, look at the language here, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning, to write it out for you in consecutive order most excellent Theophilus. Uh, That's the person he was writing to, Theophilus. And notice the reason. He says in verse 4, so that you may know the exact truth about the things that you have been taught. I want us to have confidence in the biblical account of not just this story, but everything that is in it. That said, let's read in Luke chapter 2. It says in verse 1, Luke writes, Now it came about in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. Uh, A census, of course, is counting heads. Governments do that for the purpose of control, but mainly for the purpose of taxation. So they're doing it here. We've been through them a number of times as well. In verse 2, this was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee from the city of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David. In order, they went in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child. Now, what we're seeing here, I think this is important. What we're given right from the start of this story, this account, is... Uh, is a great example of the miracle of divine providence. Providence is the idea that God is ordering and designing life according to his plan. And that is exactly what's going on here in this sense. 
according to Micah 5.2. By the way, this text, this prophecy was given 700 plus years before the birth of Jesus Christ. And it was told that the Messiah would be born in the city of Bethlehem, a, a lowly city. The problem, however, is that at this point, when the word comes to them, they are living in the city of Nazareth. And just to give you an idea of distance, notice the red dot, Nazareth, down to Bethlehem. We're talking 80 miles. This pregnant woman who is full uh, she is right at the end of her pregnancy. She has to ride that donkey over that 80-mile hilly stretch of geography. How does God work all of this out? You see, here's the thing. She has to be in Bethlehem to give birth because that's what prophecy said. Otherwise, when there's an era in the Bible, then the whole thing gets tossed. It's got to be accurate in its every detail, folks, and it is. God in his providence pulls the chain on a, on a uh, king by the name of Caesar Augustus. And at the right time in history, the word goes out that all the world should be taxed. That's an act. That's the, the timing issue is the issue that I'm getting at. God's perfect timing is not coincidental in any way. It's God's providential rule. I believe that you and I are here today based on providence. We are at the right place at the right time so that God can speak into our lives. Now look at verse 6. It says, while they were there, that is in Bethlehem, the days were completed for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. In the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all of the people. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find the baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among men with whom he, he God, is well pleased. Now, it's interesting in verse 11, we are given the identity of this baby born in a manger, and three facts are given here about him. First of all, notice he is the Savior. That word, that term means one who saves, one who delivers. Uh, we often say in evangelical circles, are you saved, brother? And people get annoyed with that, but it, it makes sense. I, I'm, I'm saved. Have you been saved? It's an important term because we have a Savior. And of course, all of the Bible teaches us that a Savior is exactly what we all need. And by the way, that's true no matter how many good works we have uh, accumulated, and it's true no matter what self-confidence we might have, the truth is we dare not attempt to stand before a holy God who is just. We dare not attempt to stand before that God in our own righteousness and on our own terms. We need, you need, I need a Savior someone who can do for me what I 
can't do for myself. And so Matthew 121 says this, and the angel here is speaking to Joseph, she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for it is he who will save his people from their sins. Notice, he will save. The word save uh, is, uh, the word Jesus literally means savior. And there's almost a play on words here for, uh, we'll call his name Yeshua, for he will Yeshua his people from their sins. That's the way it's written. It's just amazing. And he does this, why? All for his glory. Remember last week? Everything God does is ultimately for his exaltation and his glory. And of course, God also carries out our salvation, saving us from sin. He does that based on his plan. If you recall, his plan has three stages, justification, sanctification, glorification, In justification, we are made right with God. And the penalty of sin is taken away because of Christ. In sanctification, the power of sin is broken over our life. The rule of sin is broken. And God enables us through his grace and power to live holy lives. And then, of course, ultimately in glorification, We are given a resurrection body at the great rapture event, and we're taken out of this world to be with the Lord, away from the very presence of sin altogether. God is unfolding his plan in our lives. Now, I want you to notice, if you would, in verse 11, there are three things that he's teaching us about this one who is the Messiah. The first is that he is the Savior. The second is that he is the Christ. The word Christ is the Greek form of the Hebrew word Messiah. And so Jesus is his name and Christ, Messiah, is his title. It's not his first and last name, Jesus Christ. The way some guys throw it out there, you know, how in profanity it's used. It's Jesus the Messiah. And I would add something else that is important to understand here. The word Messiah means literally the anointed one. Jesus is the anointed one. That grows out of the idea how in the Old Testament there were three categories of called godly ministry that would begin with the anointing of oil. For example, David was anointed with oil as he began his reign as king. And so too, the prophets and the priests, prophet, priest, and king. Jesus is the anointed one. He is the consummate prophet, priest, and king. Born in that manger, and by the way, when he's born in our lives, he becomes that to you. As priest, he deals with your sin and your shame and your guilt. As prophet, he speaks the word of God into your life. And as king, a king rules, and that's what he does. He rules our life with his truth and his grace. Now, the third thing to notice in verse 11 about Jesus is the fact that he is Lord, who is Christ the Lord. And, of course, this is a title that underscores his deity. He is supreme in authority. That's Jesus, Messiah. Uh, He is Lord of Lords in Revelation chapter 19. Remember that passage? King of, of, think of all the kings that have been in existence. Think of all the presidents and all of the prime ministers of nations all over the world who were, who are, who shall be perhaps. He is king of kings and Lord of Lords. And the Bible says 
Philippians chapter 2, verse 9, the day is coming when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's going to happen. It's going to happen in human history. Now, in verse 12, I want you to notice when he was born, it says, and this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And so here is a God-given sign. A lot of signs throughout the Bible. The rainbow was given as a sign. Male circumcision was given as a covenant sign. Over and over again, you see signs. And his birth in a manger in this manner is a sign. That he is born in this this smelly, unsanitary stable. Placed in an unsanitary manger. All of that when he could have been born in a palace, because remember, he's king. But he chose everything that happens. In fact, it's interesting, he is visited not by the rich, not by the elite. He isn't visited by the celebrities of that day, but he is visited by men who were considered to be the dregs of Jewish peasantry in that day, shepherds. Shepherds were seen to be the low lives of that time in history. In fact, one Bible scholar wrote this of shepherds. He writes, shepherds were despised people. They were suspected of not being very careful to distinguish between mine and thine. In other words, they had sticky fingers, light fingers, however you want to put it. At least that was their reputation. Look at the next line. For this reason, they were debarred from giving evidence in court. They're notorious liars, and they couldn't even stand in court and and be used as a witness. Yet, look at the last line. Yet they received a personal angelic invitation to be witnesses for God. What a gift. I found this little pic on the internet. It's just someone's imagination. But when they saw that angelic host, I've never seen an angel, I don't think. But I'm sure it would be a breathtaking experience. And you would never forget it, and they certainly didn't. Look at the rest of this. When the angels had gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, let us go straight to Bethlehem then and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has made known to us. So they came in a hurry and found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. When they had seen this, they made known the statement which had been told them about this child, and all who heard it wondered. In other words, they're amazed at the things which had been told them by the shepherds. But Mary, in contrast, treasured all of these things, pondering them in her heart. By the way, the word pondering is an interesting Greek word it's if you were trying to connect dots on a chart that's the word you would use she's she's connecting dots she was visited by angel, the angel gabriel she was prophesied over by her uh, cousin elizabeth and all of this is happening to a young girl about 16 years of age all of this is happening and she is mature enough to handle this as God is using her in this way. Verse 20 says, And the shepherds went back, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen, just as has been told them. I think that line there is in contrast to their reputation. They didn't deviate the story in any way, they told it now just, and who wouldn't? (laughs) 
who wouldn't say everything accurate? What we're reading here in all of this account written by Luke and written by the inspiration of God the Holy Spirit, but this account of the birth of Christ is what theologians refer to as the humiliation of Jesus. The fact that he voluntarily chooses to be born a human person in this way. Philippians 2.6 speaks of the humiliating descent of Jesus. By the way, that was another pick. I, I thought of how Mary, when she pondered Jesus, and in the shadow as the baby is held up, the pick of a cross, because that's his destiny. In fact, Paul puts it like this. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. J.I. Packer writes this in his commentary on this verse. He says, the crucial, the crucial significance of the, the manger at Bethlehem lies in its place in the sequence of steps down that led the Son of God to the cross of Calvary. And we do not understand it till we see it in that context. I think he's absolutely right. As if to say, we need to hold before us the fact that Jesus was literally born to die. Born to die. And of course, this scene of Bethlehem's manger is just the first step in this whole process of his embracing again and again the humble choice. And when you think about it, it makes it so much easier for us. I mean, he's willing to go that route and he's showing us the way. He's not calling us to do something that he would not do, that he has not done. He calls us to humble ourselves before God and to live the humble life. And he, of course, has modeled that for us. Now, I want to close with three things here that we can learn from the great humiliation of Jesus. And here's my first point. Number one, his condescension shows and teaches us how truly desperate our sinful state and how much we need a Savior. In other words, that God would do this, that he would subject himself to this, and it's his choice. It's his choice. In fact, Jesus said in John 10, 17, for this reason the Father loves me because I lay down my life so that I may take it again. No one has taken it from me. I lay it down on my own initiative. Everything about the coming of Jesus is his embracing hum humble choices again at his birth and again and again through his life and his work and his ministry and then ultimately on his way to the cross. He lays down his life freely because of our desperate state. Yes, God is that holy. Sin is that bad. Here's my second point, because Jesus as God in eternity becomes one with us in humanity, this means God is now able to personally understand our human sufferings. I like this sta uh, statement by Dennis McCallum. He writes, when we suffer, we instinctively want the company of someone who has suffered in like manner. This is because we know they will understand what we are experiencing. I think we've all been there. And that the advice we receive from them, though it may be difficult, will be tempered by one who has taken his own medicine. 
If I've never been married, how am I going to talk to you about your marriage? You know, I need to be in your shoes to some degree to be able to relate with you. And our Lord is in our shoes in his humanity. And when we pray, we pray to God the Father through Jesus, and we have someone at the right hand of the Father who lives to make intercession for us, and he knows what it's like to be human and to suffer. He knows what it's like to be mocked by his family because his family mocked him. He knows what it's like to have financial troubles, to have problems with people who don't like you. The Bible says he was despised of men. He suffered. Isaiah 53 talks about the fact that he was put down. He was mocked. He knows what it's like to go through those things. And so we have one who can relate with us. And that leads me lastly to this. The humiliation of Jesus shows us the amazing degree to which God is willing to show his love for us. Here's a, a text that everyone knows. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. There's the message. And yet, a word of caution here. Love does not save you. What saves you is the work of Jesus Christ as your substitute on the cross. That's where your salvation lies, in the finished work. Love motivates him. But love alone does not save you. Look at this passage. 1 John 4. God showed how much he loved us. How? By sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Look at this, Romans 5, 6. When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us, for us sinners. Uh, do you realize when you say, Jesus died for me, you are also at one and the same time saying, I'm the kind of person who needs dying for you got to get that because so many people just kind of scoff at the idea of the death of Christ. Uh, sorry about that. I'm about to do a Jimmy Swaggart here, I think, you know. <laughs> but you get the idea, I think. There we go. The fact that, I mean, it, it's just overwhelming to understand the depths of human depravity. We don't get it because we live in relative righteousness. We compare ourselves with one another. But the contrast is not with one another. It's with a just and holy God who in Habakkuk 1.13 is so pure of eyes that he cannot look upon sin. So Paul says when we were utterly helpless to save ourselves. Christ died for us sinners. Verse 7, now most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. I'm sure there are people in your life that you would die for, but they're good people, people that you love. Look at this. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us, their substitution, while we were still sinners. There you have it. That's really the message. God holds before us this whole scene of his humiliation, which begins at the manger in Bethlehem, and then with each step, it through his life, it descends ultimately to the place of the cross. And God holds this scene before us, and he's essentially saying, this is what you are worth to me. 
not because of righteousness in you, but for some reason known only to God, we are worth a son to him. And that's the love of God. But I must remind you, love alone does not save. You must respond to God on the basis of what Jesus did as your substitute on the cross, where he took your place, took your sin, took your punishment, took the judgment of God in your behalf upon himself. And now God says, open up your life to that love, to that person, and to that message, and the Savior will be born in you. That's the Christian message. When I was in the army and I was stationed at this time in Fairbanks, Alaska, I was not a Christian. I didn't think about being a Christian. It just, it just wasn't in my mind. I never prayed. I never went to church. I never read a Bible. Tried reading it once. It just, I blew it off. I had no interest. I mean, I had no interest in God or the things of God. I was 21 years old. I became a Christian about a year, about a little over a year later because I was released from the army. But I remember this scene, and to show you how, to just kind of stress how powerful it must have been in my life is because I remember the scene so well. It's kind of an odd scene. I was in this restroom, in the barracks, and there was etched into the door of one of the bathroom stalls a statement. I looked at it, and I have to tell you, for the first time in my life, I was stunned. And it, I, I, I had never felt convicted before. But when I saw this and read this, it just jumped out at me and I thought to myself, I'm missing something. This was the first step really in a process that God was using to bring me into a place of receiving Christ and the experience of eternal salvation. It's a very simple thing that was written there. It was this, what will you do with Jesus? neutral you cannot be. Someday your heart will be asking, what will he do with me? I read that that day and I thought to myself, I'm missing something. I'm really missing something. And a year later, a year and a half later, I was born again. God transformed my life because I opened up to him. I wonder if that would speak to you today. What will you do with Jesus? Because neutral, you cannot be. Someday your heart will be asking, what will he do with me? Let's pray.